That's interesting. Okay. Well, let's turn on the test test. All right. Class, the sound is going to be provided by the U.S. military sometime during about 1968 in the Vietnam War. Um, but beyond that, uh, we do want to get into our study of the Back to the Bible series. We are on lesson three. Boy, that's um, for those listening at home, uh, we. I don't know, we, we may actually hear about some people having uh, uh, frustration issues. Oh. Yeah, let's, all right. Um, there's a good chance that a button has been in a, inadvertently pressed up there, perhaps the phantom power button. Um, all right. We are in Back to the Bible Lesson 3. We have six more weeks that we're going to be spending covering this one. Now, that's going to be beneficial so that we can really take our time and look at some of the illustrations that pertain to baptism. And also, this study delves into some uh, more sensitive or at least emotional topics, particularly when it comes to people having to face their own uh, personal spiritual condition. That being said, we pick up with uh, where this study begins. Okay. There are some folks that aren't going to be able to hear me, but the folks that can't hear me also cannot hear the fighting cats that are in our uh, sound system. So uh, if we turn up the speakers, uh, then there is a good chance that all of us are going to become highly frustrated and we'll be on the news. Uh, so uh, we're trying to do what we can to get the sound stabilized, but we, I don't know, honestly, it, it sounds like we're trying to listen to a radio station out of uh, Dallas instead of one out of Memphis. Um, so... Looking at our study, uh, it begins in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Uh, as we begin this study, there's something that's going to be very vital. The people with whom you are studying think they are saved. Rarely is it going to be the case that you start a study with someone and you've asked that question, if you were to die tonight, where, where would you go? And they say, well, I'd be lost. Matter of fact, if I am studying with someone that says that, there's a very good chance that we're not going to follow this course of studies. There's a very good chance that when that person recognizes, hey, I'm lost right now, then there's a one study method that might just fit the bill. There are times when it won't, but for our purposes, by and large, when you get to this point in the study, it's, uh, you are studying with someone who still thinks that he or she is saved, is a Christian. Now, with that thought in mind, in moving through this study, it's going to be a matter of letting that person come to the realization that, hey, I'm not. Now, for what it's worth, they may have gotten some, uh, some indicators in the previous study here to tell you if it's going to make that noise no matter what I might just use this one uh, they may have gotten some indicators in the previous study uh, when they were studying the nature of the church because in looking at the nature of the church and the identifying characteristics of the church they should have seen some uh, patterns as it pertains to worship that are different than what they have always known or accustomed to doing so they should have been noticing a few differences between what they've known 
what they've done, and what the Bible says. All that being said, when we begin this study, there's a very good chance that they have, uh, uh, they are still convinced that they are Christians. Don't sit there and go, now you know you're lost, right? It's a great way to start any study, right? The, the classic, you know you're going to hell, right? No, they don't. By and large, they do not. So, in engaging in this study, we start with Isaiah 59. The Lord's hand is not short that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you, and he will not hear. Now, the point to be drawn from Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 is that what hides God's face from people? Your blank, your sins. All right, your sins have hid his face from you. Did I turn that on? Yes. So what separates man from God? Sin. You will have a question that asks a person whether or not he or she has ever sinned. It will also be relevant in moving through this study, potentially to help folks recognize sins that they've ignored that are sins. Outward obvious sins. We'll get to that thought momentarily. For now... We've got the answer to this particular question. Your sins have hid God's face from you. 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever sinneth transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is what? Transgression of God's law. Or, as the uh, New King James has it, lawlessness. So sin is transgression of God's law or lawlessness. Can I tell you how much fun it is to try to teach while listening to this? I hope you all are just as entertained as I am. <laughs> all right, but we're going to keep a chin up. James 1, beginning in verse 14. James said, Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. According to James 1, man is tempted when he is blank. Drawn away of his own lust. We've got to emphasize his own lust. It's not someone else's lust that draw a person away, it's his own. When lust has conceived, it produces or brings forth what? Sin. So if a person sins... Side question to ask right here. This is a question that might challenge preconceived notions. This is a question that is intended to check understanding and gain commitment. When a person sins, whose fault is it? Drawn away of his own lust, right? Okay. So sin separates us from God. Sin is lawlessness. Sin starts with man's own lust or man's own desires. Going ahead and moving forward. James 4, 17. Another description of sin. Uh, in fact, in looking at this passage, sidebar. Typically speaking, James 4, 17 is not put in its full context. There's a good chance we've heard James 4, 17 quoted for years and decades. Well, when you know to do good and you don't do it, that's sin. Yep, James said it. But what's the context? There are those that would use it to say, well, when you know to uh, be helping the poor and you don't do it, it's sin. Well, what if I don't have the funds to help? There's some good that I know to do, but I'm not able to do. There's some positive behaviors that I know to do that I'm not able to do. And that's really not James's point. James is talking about our plans. James 4, beginning in verse 13, he says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we'll go into this city, we'll continue their year, buy and sell and get gain. Folks knew where they were going, what they were going to do, how long they were going to stay, what the outcome would be, when they were going to go. 
They, they had their plans arranged. They had it all laid out in their minds. James says, but you don't know what will be on the morrow. What you ought to say is, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Watch your life. It's a vapor. It appears for a little time. It vanishes away. They, they were taking tomorrow for granted and boasting about it. The th situation James describes is an extended version of what was described Shall we pray to get? Um, <laughs> the situation James described was actually a parallel of what was described in Proverbs 27 when the wise man said, uh, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Watch your life. It's a vapor. It appears for a little time and it vanishes away. What you ought to say is, what you ought to say is, what should they have been doing? They should have been saying, if the Lord will, we'll live and we'll do this or we'll do that. They should have been submitting their plans and their ambitions to God. What you ought to say is, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you... Glory in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. James said that by bragging about tomorrow and leaving God out of it, that was evil. So then that brings us to James 2, 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, what was the good that they should have been doing? Keeping God in their plans. Keeping God in their plans. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. And that's a bit of a sidebar. But it's a good thing to keep Scripture in its proper context, right? Otherwise, otherwise we find ourselves using verses out of context and turning them into pretexts and just using them to say what we've always claimed they said instead of what God intended them to say. All that being said, James 4.17 The first question under this passage can still be uh, answered based on what's said in the verse. We just want to make sure that we understand what the, the passage is teaching and what it's not implying. James says, if one knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Absolutely. Now, by the way, another uh, thought. If there's good to do, and I don't do it, well, not doing what I ought to do is sin whether I know it or not. James is discussing the situation where there's a specific good that he has in mind. And it's the idea of including God in their plans. To him that knows to do good and does it not to him it's sin. Now, have you ever failed to do what you know was right? When you ask a person that question, what answer are you probably going to get? Have you ever failed to do what you knew was right? Ananias studied with someone that would say, no, not me. Because he'd lived in all good conscience under that day. His name was Paul. Saul at the time. And that's an individual that had to be shown that what he'd been doing wasn't right, even though he was living in a good conscience. By the way, Jesus went ahead and demonstrated that when he had that little talk on the road to Damascus. The fact here being this, there may be people that will say, no, no, I've never failed to do what I knew was right. Don't tell them, yes, you have. You go ahead and assume they're giving you an honest answer. But that person might need pointed toward behaviors that actually are sinful that he or she has not been willing to recognize as contrary to the will of God. As we move through these, there are certain questions that we might get an answer we didn't really anticipate or it wasn't the preferred answer, but we want them to be honest, especially when it's a self-assessment type question. Romans 3. Evan, go ahead and hop in here and fight the static whenever you would like, man. All right. Romans 3.10. Uh, 
There is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, the question with this passage, how many are righteous? None. Wait a minute. Are Christians righteous? Okay, pl please remember that. Please remember that those that are Christians are justified. And when we read Romans 3 and we see some of the things that Paul has to say about the idea of there's none righteous, no, not one. Paul is talking about people without Christ. People outside of Jesus. He's talking about the condition of souls, whether they be Hebrew, whether they be Gentile. He's talking about the condition of souls outside of Christ. Here's why that's important. Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many have sinned? All. What about that little baby? What about that five-year-old? Who's being described here? People that are capable of sinning. And the capacity to sin involves accountability. So this is talking about people that are able to sin. In reading this passage, uh, the, the way to describe it might simply be, now, uh, all describing those that are able to make choices, those that are able to decide for themselves, those that are accountable. But how many are righteous? None. How many accountable people have sinned? All. Does this include you? 99.44% of the time, what answer are you going to get? Yes. Some of you may remember that percentage number from an ivory commercial. But 99.44% of the time, you're going to get a, a yes answer. Every now and then, someone may just say, no. It's not time to prove him wrong yet. We'll get to that momentarily. But for now, uh, how many have sinned? Who's guilty? Biblically speaking, anyone that's outside of Christ, any accountable person is in need of, of Christ. <laughs> you might just need to use that one. someone but if I had to pick one of the three I would say this one is is the tough one because um, you've had all these gain commission uh, gain commitment questions and you've really studied God's Word in God's church and they've they've seen what truth is in God's standard and and how how we create our standard in the church what we follow and then you get to this point and it gets very very personal with people and ask somebody, uh, how many have sinned? Well, all have sinned. Does this include you? When, when I get to this point, I would jot down 1 Corinthians 6, 11 as a side passage. And that's where Paul talks to uh, the Christians, and he says, such were some of you. And I, and I really like that. And I would say, yeah, it applied to me too. Um, yeah, I sinned. I sinned, and I needed something as well. And it's it just a real simple way to make a connection with a person. Um, you don't want to come across as some sort of, you know, long-robed individual that floats above the ground, and, and you can't really relate with them. You're, you're a person just like they are. So when, when you ask this, you're, you're essentially asking for a commitment on, you know, are you imperfect? And you don't want to come from a, a position of, well, that must be pretty rough. You know, that you want to show that such were some of you. L look at how the apostle talks to Christians. You were this way. Uh, you were covered in sin, but you've been washed. And then that kind of goes into, well, well why would you need to be washed in the first place? You know, what are the consequences of sin? 
which is what we're about to get to. But I just like that. That way you can relate to them, and they don't feel so isolated sitting there as a rank, horrible person, and, and you're not. You're sitting across the table. You want to connect, uh, especially right here, I think. Two thoughts. If you can float above the ground, that's a new trick. <laughs> Second thought. You're studying. Um, sometimes some of these uh, comments or observations that you might make, like what Evan just described, are going to be very suitable because as you're studying with a person, you notice a certain sullenness on certain questions uh, or a hesitation with some questions. And it's not a hesitation that, uh, that seems to give the idea of not knowing the answer, but struggling to face the reality of the answer. Um, have your eyes open to your student. Now, don't be staring for every move and just look like you're some kind of a, an interrogator. Uh, but pay attention to the one with whom you're studying. And oftentimes, uh, some, of these, uh, some of these responses on your part will come very natural because it'll be a very natural form of encouragement uh, as, you, as you lead your friend forward in a study of God's Word. Because hopefully by this point, you do have a relationship with the individual. Now, um, coming back to our study, uh, so how many have sinned and does, does this include you? If a person says no, okay, don't sweat it yet, we'll get to that. For now, move forward. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The question is, the wages of sin is death. The next question is, how many sins must a person commit, must you commit, in order to be separated from God eternally? How many did it take for Adam and Eve? Just one. One sin's all that does it. Now, side question, is it possible, hmm. is it possible to be guilty of a sin without realizing I did it? Is it possible to be guilty of a sin without realizing you did it? Okay. Let's move forward. 1 Corinthians 6. Evan just alluded to verse 11 from this passage. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, and such were some of you. Yes, Paul's telling Christians, you once acted this way, but this isn't who you are anymore. The question we want to draw right here is, will the unrighteous inherit the kingdom of God? Okay, now let's consider some of those unrighteous actions. Neither fornicators. How prevalent is fornication in our society? prolific this might be an occasion if you are aware of a certain behavior on the part of the other person to look at a series of definitions from passages like 1 Corinthians 6 9 and 10 and let those definitions speak for themselves fornication sexual contact outside of marriage Fornicators, uh, idolaters, the worship of something other than God, adulterers, a specific type of fornication that involves a, a married person being with someone other than that person's spouse. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind, 
descriptions of homosexual behavior. Thieves. We understand what thieves are. Covetous. What's covetousness? Ultimately, it's not, only a, it's not only an ambition, it's not only a desire for something, but it's a desire for something that others have that, uh, uh, that moves you to bring a negative impact on others. This is a, a motive that connects directly with jealousy and envy. You ever been jealous of someone? You ever been envious? These might be questions that can help trigger some thoughts. Thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers. Revilers are those that, that bite back, that talk down, that always have a snide comment. They're just always negative toward folks. Nor extortioners. And if the behaviors described in 1 Corinthians 6 don't include a definition that would hit on a, a sin in this individual's life, you might look at Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Here's the reason this is important. Now, Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost, Peter preached to that crowd. Did that crowd have sin in their lives? Peter did not stand up and tell them what every action they'd ever done was that qualified as sin, but he identified the most prominent one of which they collectively were guilty. What was it? Murder. Just look at the very last verse of Peter's sermon, Acts 2.36. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that you're guilty. Because God made this same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter identified the most prominent sin. You go to Luke chapter 3. John the baptizer dealing with all the Jews that came out to him. He told the, the common people that they uh, needed uh, to, uh, to be generous and, and give of what they had because apparently they weren't doing it. He told the uh, publicans to stop being so uh, dishonest. And he told the uh, soldiers, that is essentially the policemen, uh, not to charge people accused, uh, to charge people falsely and to be content with their wages. John hit on the most prominent sins among those groups. What are some of the most prominent sins that we'll encounter today? Is fornication pretty prominent? Yeah. And there are people that will deny that it's even wrong. Dishonesty pretty prominent? Yeah. So, you take a look at the way John the baptizer preached. Jesus speaking to that rich young ruler. Jesus, what do I need to do? You need to get rid of everything you love more than me. Go sell all that you have, give to the poor, then come follow me. Jesus addressed the largest, biggest problem in this man's life, which was covetousness. We do not set out to be policemen, trying to identify every little wrong aspect of people's lives so that we can make them feel guilty about it. But we do set out to help people see what God's expectations and desires are. And if we're studying with folks that are in a sin, and, and, and we're aware of that sin, then it will be very important for us gently, delicately, prudently, but understandingly to help that person see what the Bible has to say about that behavior. If Jesus brought out the most prominent sins, if John the baptizer brought out the most prominent sins, if uh, Peter did so, if Paul did so in Athens when he says, you people... Uh, uh, worship God without knowing Him. He, he spotlighted their idolatry. The New Testament pattern when it comes to preaching and teaching identifies the most prominent of the sins. There are times we'll need to do that as well. So, moving forward. Last passage that we'll examine tonight. Matthew 13, verses 40 through 42. Uh, this is Jesus... Uh, 
giving the parable of the tares. And in so doing, uh, the point that is made is that at the end of the world, uh, the Lord will send forth his angels. Uh, just like the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send forth the angels. They'll gather out of the kingdom all things that offend, that is, all things that cause to sin or stumble, and them which do iniquity, sinners, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The question under this passage says, at the end of the world, sinners will be what? Punished? Burned? What's being described in a figure here? Judgment. And the ultimate punishment on the other side of judgment, which would be hell. Which, by the way, will be the aspect of this study that we will cover next week. Because when you get to page 4, and we'll introduce the idea for now but we'll spend more time on it next week. When we get to page 4, the heading is God's justice. When it comes to the word hell, isn't it amazing how flippantly people use the word, yet how opposed they are to the actual biblical definition of it? Typically speaking... How many people accept the reality of eternal punishment? Don't be surprised when you're studying with folks and they refuse to, to pursue that idea. Now, in the questions that we'll examine when next we meet, uh, there's going to be a focus on God's justice. What's justice? What's justice? Don't say he was the Braves right fielder back in 1994. What's justice? Okay. Justice is meeting out that which is fair, balanced. The word deserved what was utilized. So if there is someone guilty of arson, is the judge who sentences this person in a position to where he must administer justice. Justice involves punishment. Suppose the judge looks at a person who burned his neighbor's house down because their, their roof uh, blocked his view of the sunset. And his neighbors were in the house when he did it. They got out, but should the judge say, you know, you need to be nicer to people. Or should there be some punishment involved? That's attempted murder. There better be punishment involved. Justice demands punishment. Just a thought to plant for now. Because when we study next week, we'll look at the verses presented here. We want to take our time moving through these. We've got five more weeks to cover this study. And we want to make sure that as we do so, we're considering these ideas so that we can move through them confidently uh, with a strong familiarity with the concepts being discussed. Evan, what would you add as we close, sir? Uh, I would probably just say uh, one thing about uh, what, what he's getting into is this is a very harsh topic. Uh, don't be afraid at all to lean into this subject. This, this is really, really important for people to see. Um, <clears throat> this is what God sent His Son to this earth to tell us and to warn us about. We can't, uh, through scientific method, peer into hell and say, oh, I don't want to go there. Uh, the Son of God came to warn us that <clears throat> judgment is imminent, um, but a reward is waiting. So when you're talking about these things, uh, just a, in a page and a half, you're going to see the flip side of it. But you have to look at both sides. Um, so 
I know when I, when I started <clears throat> doing this, I made the mistake once or twice of trying to, I don't want to say sugarcoat, but trying to make it less abrasive and just, well, you know, okay, all right, let's move to the next one. Uh, and in, in recent months and, and even in recent years, just go, just go into it head first, and it helps. It's very good for them to read what the Scripture says, I promise. That's all I had to add. Well, he means is going to the scriptures head first. That, that, okay. <laughs> <laughs>